the American food system now is radical. It is radical that the food pyramid did what it did, said, told people what to do. It is radical that one man does 5 million hogs a year in Iowa. It is radical that a dairy operation in Indiana does as much manure in a single day as the city of Austin, Texas. And so much of the reforms people have been pushing for are very traditional. Industry hacks will always say you're radical and you're like, no, this is pretty off the rails what's happened to America's food system. Today's guest is Austin Farrick, a Yale University fellow and expert in agriculture and antitrust policy. He's a former tax economist at the U.S. Treasury Department, co-chair of the Biden campaign's Agriculture and Antitrust Policy Committee, and author of the new book, Barron's money, power, and the corruption of America's food industry, which will be today's topic. Welcome, Austin. Thanks for having me on, Jesse. So I'm going to start with a quote from your book. Let's just read it here. Cargill's power is illustrated by the fact that it's easier to get a healthy, locally sourced meal in Washington, D.C. or New York City than it is in my home state of Iowa, surrounded by some of the world's most productive agricultural lands, end of your quote. Why is it easier to get a delicious locally sourced meal in D.C. or New York City than an agricultural haven, so to speak? This sounds like it's something out of a dystopian science fiction novel here. Oh, totally. I mean, I remember when I, that line came to me. I worked on this book for five years, and my husband and I met in Washington, D.C., and I kid you not, our favorite date night was this place called Cava. It's like Mediterranean Chipotle. And it was just, they always like local food. They would list on their, this was when it's small before it became big. Like now, it would list all its local stuff. And it was just fresh. And then I remember being in Atlantic, Iowa at a diner with a buddy. And it's just being like, God, this food all tastes the same. And it's so blah. And part of that is, it's just, it's the consolidation of the food system. Um, you know, these, like take Cisco. I mean, Cisco is a massive food distributor. They don't, they don't want to deal with local providers, local food. They want someone who can serve 50 states. And I kind of joked the other day that the creation of one Robert Barron makes a bunch of other Robert Barons. And the Cargill's chapter to me, like from that, is really the story of the farm bill. And the farm bill is pushing farmers and designed to overproduce grains at the expense of everything else. Because it's all about making highly processed food cheap. Because that's what this system wants to move. This distribution system, it doesn't want to do fresh food. And so what we've seen is as we throw tons more money to carrots and soybeans, you know, junk food is relatively cheaper than fresh produce. And then the produce we have is garbage because a lot of it's being outsourced. You basically have seven chapters, minus kind of an intro and conclusion. And then each of your seven chapters is broken down into a different baron of the agricultural sector. So you have a hog baron, grain baron, coffee baron, dairy baron, berry baron, uh, slaughterhouse baron, and then the grocery baron. Two of the barons were not located in the U.S. You have the, the coffee barons or JABs located in Germany. And then the slaughterhouse baron, I think maybe this is more common. People probably know that this is you know JBS, which is out of Brazil. But of the, I mean, I think as one of us, it's kind of surprising to find that you know two of the barons aren't even located in yeah. the U.S. when this is like a book really about the U.S. food supply. Yeah. I mean, that's, we're just, I mean, guess let me step back and say the goal of each barren chapter really is to tell a structural story is I'm kind of using these barons as narrative devices to tell these bigger things of how did we get to a point where one dairy farmer who lives at the Ritz Carlton in Puerto Rico or claims residency there does, you know, is part of an operation with 35,000 cows. And so to me, the question is why? And then to that point on the food system, what shocked me about this book is actually I begin a lot of press in England and like Australia. And a lot of it is, is just, they see what happened to the American food system. And they don't want to go down that road. And like, you're seeing like the, the, these global barons, like the ones you mentioned, it's just, this is what happens. It's just kind of this unchecked power, this like massive consolidation. And it also kind of goes back to the simple notion. The goal of any corporate executive is monopoly. And so you just see this, like, you know, boulder rolling down a hill that just isn't stopping. Of these seven barons, is there any one that you found to be worse than the other? You chose seven, as you mentioned, just to kind of tell a narrative, but you could have picked so many others. Maybe the worst one wasn't even part of this book. I'm laughing because uh, there's a line in the introduction where I mentioned I have a whole B-list side of barons. That's totally a Carly Rae Jepsen reference. Uh, my husband and I love her. 
I know, stereotypically. But yeah, I mean, there's a whole list of different, you know, my hog baron, about 10 industrial hog operators control 70% of the hog market now in America. So I could have done nine other stories. Part of it, writing narratives, is I want to mix up the, the story format. I didn't want to tell the same story. So like my book opens with kind of a trashy Florida new money story with my hog baron. And then I go to aristocratic, old fashioned, waspy money with Cargill's my farm bill. So, you know, there is some of that going on. And you know, also just putting this book out to the universe is just people are telling me more about more shenanigans going on. I mean, I was in Minnesota and they were like, oh, you should know about this potato baron. <laughs> uh, and then that said, though, to your question, though, which I find really interesting is which one's the worst? I love asking that question to people, too, because I thought there'd be a universal answer and there's not. I mean, some people are morally repulsed by just the melt, the dairy barons just because they're kind of cartoonishly villain. I kind of find Walmart's a weird one to say as a villain, but their power, they're the king of kings. I mean, if there's a table, the barons, they're the head honcho. We have never seen someone with this much power in the food system. And keep in mind, the family can still controls like around 50% of the company. Jeff Bezos only owns like 10, 12% of Amazon. And Walmart's market share in grocery, they sell one in three groceries. That's the same as the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth combined. I really do think the most powerful person in the food system is a Walmart food buyer. I and mean, they're buying food for one in three Americans. And evil, I mean, just the way they treat their workers, I mean, just the way they behave, it, you can kind of, evil is all relative here. But I, that's an intention I had writing this book is I didn't want to be polemic. I just kind of wanted to lay the stats out there and let you come to your own conclusions. Because a lot of other people, too, are repulsed by the Brazilian barons, JBS, my slaughtering barons. But I know to me, I read that chapter and I'm not even repulsed by them. I'm just, I just keep thinking of them as a kid that's never been disciplined. And my anger actually a lot lies with the current USDA secretary, Tom Vilsack, because this has been to address their con their market abuse. It's one of the most bipartisan things right now in America. I mean, ranchers are being gouged, are underpaid. You're being gouged at the store for meat. And he's just incompetent to do anything meaningful. So like, that's where my anger lies is I've never seen someone just whiff at a pinata like he is right now. I talk about Walmart, the Waltons you mentioned is the richest family in the world. I think you say their net worth is like $245 billion collectively. And they own two NFL football teams, the Rams and the Denver Broncos, which is insane to think there's 32 NFL football teams and one family owns two of them. <laughs> you know, that's that like, they just have so much money that like, even their little pet projects are so influential. And like, this is a dumb example. So the grandkids are taking over the empire and they're very bourgeois. Um, they're kind of, you're, see, you're, you're seeing the gentrification of Ben Belt, like in this really weird, like almost like Brazilian way where it's so have, have not. They're building a new headquarters from Walmart that looks like Silicon Valley. But like one grandson really loves cycling. So he spent like a hundred million dollars to make Benville, Arkansas, the hub of American cycling. <laughs> so all the nonprofits are moving there. The high end bike companies are moving there. And it's just because that's his little, you know, his little interest, but he's able to like, sh because of how much power they have, you know, he can really shape that tiny little ecosystem. You talk about the illusion of choice in the book quite a bit. And that, this is one of the quotes I found interesting, but you say corporations use different brands to cater to different socioeconomic classes. These brands create the illusion of choice. It may seem as if shoppers have options, but they're all really choosing is their preferred price point. That's why Lenscraft or Sunglasses Hut or Sunglass Hut, Pearl Vision, Target Optical, Glasses.com, FramesDirect.com, iBuyDirect, Clearly, Ray-Ban, and Oakley are all owned by one foreign-based company. Of course, that was an example you gave outside of food, but then you talk about peanut butter and there's all these brands. You mean Smuckers, Adams, Laura's, Gutters, Santa Cruz Organic are all owned by Smuckers. All these industries do the same thing. But I guess my question on this is like, are you actually just buying in the example of the the glasses? Are you basically buying the exact same pair of glasses in the example of peanut butter? Are you buying the exact same peanut butter just at different price points? Or are they actually creating different products? Or is this just purely marketing for each one of these examples? I honestly don't know. I think it, there might be like some base peanut butter and then they tweak it a little bit. It's funny, that whole illusion of choice thing to me comes from my father. My dad used to be a beer distributor. So I grew up going to all the gas stations in town and he would just tell me, you know, like the upper class white yuppie wants to think they're diff consuming a different product than maybe a lower income Latino person. So they just, you know, 
essentially take a quasi similar product and just repackage it. But it's reflecting the inequality of our society. You know what I mean? That Whole Foods consumer likes to think they're getting a different product than the dollar general consumer. And that to me is like kind of this, why the concentration of the food system is under notice by people. Because, you know, it's not standard oil that puts its name on everything. It's like you said, those different brands of peanut butter where you can look at the peanut butter section and think there's, you have choices when you really don't. There's that illusion of choice. And on top of it, a lot of times too, these companies do the store brand. It's really hard to find that out. Either you have to talk to industry insiders or like in the case of peanut butter, you look for peanut recalls and that's usually when you see it. So even though Smuckers might have like a 60, 70% market share in peanut butter, it's probably higher because they're doing the the store store brands. We just talked a little bit earlier about like, what is the worst? You know, what was the worst of the seven barons? And for me, I actually, I kind of thought maybe Driscoll was the worst and also the the most brilliant at the same time, because like you basically call it the Nike model. They don't really produce any berries themselves. I think it's the best business strategy, but also the most sinister at the same time, which depending on how you look at business, it could be, they could be geniuses or diabolical. But you say basically it's helpful to think of Driscoll as less as a farm b- business than as a genetics and marketing company. They own the patents to the berry genetics, which are then licensed to approve growers on an exclusive basis. And then, of course, all the berries are sold under the Driscoll name, which you kind of mentioned is kind of like Nike, where maybe you produce a shirt in a factory and then you throw a Nike label on it. But I kind of thought like just the whole operation, like they, I mean, I thought they have probably the most power of any of these companies. Power and like, I, as you were saying that example, I've been struggling with the right word to articulate and I feel the same way about Sam Walton, where you both admire, there's a brilliant, like an evil brilliance there almost. Church schools, I mean, they they, pop, they published op-eds with the former Democrat governor, Jerry Brown of California, you know, pretending to be do-gooders. I mean, I, I've seen so much of their PR videos. They're really good at controlling their narrative. But then there's this really dark undercurrent. That chapter two is like, that was not my original book proposal. That one I kind of stumbled into where I read an article on the Christian Science Monitor like 10 years ago where like, 70% of the apple juice in America is coming from China, which honestly blew my mind because apples are easy to grow and you can pretty much grow them anywhere. And you realize, oh, what's driving that is probably labor. So it's probably cheaper to pick, pay someone to pick an apple in China, process it, ship water halfway across the ocean than it is to do it here. So it kind of led me down this hunch of, oh, there's an offshoring of the produce system going on here that's not been appreciated. But then as I, and that, that was the original goal of the Driscoll chapter. But as I started looking at their business model, I realized, oh, they're doing the chicken thing. (laughs) I mean, the the business model you just articulated, that Nike thing in the food system really derives from chicken. And part of it is is when we wrote these regulations a century ago to tackle the meat trust in response to Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, and Teddy Roosevelt's work, we didn't write chicken into the regulations because there weren't chicken slaughterhouses. You just had chicken in your backyard and butchered it. So it happened down south most famously by Tyson's was they basically applied that sharecropping model that really exploited a model to black farmers and they applied it to the chicken production. And instead of you know making chicken behave like the other meats as the industry grew, it became a race to the bottom. Like they call it chickenization. And so it did the pork. And then that's what Driscoll's did to the berry industry, which to me is like, I don't, to my knowledge, hadn't, hadn't been really, those, that connection hadn't been made. And so that, and that to me is like another good point, good example of a lot of these dark things from the past that we have we previously addressed are coming back in a really dark ways. Yeah, you're talking just about the offshoring and you have this quote, which you basically say that the ability to send production offshore undermines labor reform for American farm workers and essentially reverses decades of hard fought gains. As one produce farmer told me, any effort to improve the conditions of the American farm workers essentially means that more produce will be grown outside of america and then you're talking about like old school you know techniques that they used i didn't see the the uh, phrase banana republic in your book but it seems like we're back to like the banana republic days especially you know you're talking about go back to drisco about how they're in mexico now they you know it's even cheaper labor than they could get in the u.s even though the u.s has special visas and undocumented they're not even paying undocumented workers minimum wage and then this town in Mexico, they use so much water. They just built a desalination plant, which of course is like super expensive to build. It just shows you how much profits they're ringing out where they can build their own desalination plant. <laughs> oh, let's even add on to that. Cause that one to me, it's even darker. So like 
basically what's happened in California is anything labor intensive, you know, went south of the border. So that's why California is so nut intensive because that's capital. Um, and that part of Baja, I mean, they get as much rain as Death Valley, which is three inches a year. So they drain the aquifers. As you said, they built those desalinization plants. But on top of it, no one really lived there. It was pretty sparsely populated. So they brought in a lot of indigenous workers. And these things are almost modern day plantations. I mean, they are, you put journalists, put their lives at risk when you go into those, when you try to report those stories out. And on top of it, I mean, there's been a lot of reporting Reuters, just how much Mexican gangs are getting into the produce industry with avocados. The fact that we have gangs and avocados kind of tells you how far we've fallen. And I should just say this whole thing is this makes bad tasting food. Like that berry grown in Baja is not engineered for taste. It's engineered for durability. So when it travels, you know, thousands of miles to your plate versus a berry from down the street, it's just not good. That, that to me is one of the biggest things I learned writing this book is just so many corners have been cut this race to the bottom. It just makes a very meh meal. Yes, yeah, so I used to live in uh, like Colorado ski towns and there's like a lot of like natural hot springs. And I was in one of the hot springs one day and I was talking to this this lady that owned a, a Mexican restaurant in town. And uh, she was talking about, I was like, oh, like, how did you end up in the US? You know, and she's like, oh, like I, I owned avocado farms. And then the cartel basically was like shaking me down. And I'm like, and I'm like, I was like shocked to hear this. And she's like, oh yeah, it's like the cartel like controls. The, people just think of it as the drug trade, but she's like, they've gotten into everything. Yeah. I mean, it's in the day when you're growing an avocado or a tomato or like pick some produce, an apple, there's not really, what's the cost advantage from doing it in another country? And it's really just lower environmental labor standards. And I think there's this whole naiveness when we sign NAFTA and all that of like, oh, and that's just what's happened. And then um, it's when these supply chains get long, transparency collapses. And to me, the scary thing here too, is we get numb to the exploitations, kind of like t-shirts. You had so much clothing in America it used to be made in North Carolina. And then it moved offshore. And it's almost like a yearly ritual that there's a horrific fire in one of these factories in Southeast Asia or India or Bengali, Bangladesh. And these companies don't care. That's the scary thing with like this Driscoll Nike model is they can pretend to like, oh, these are independent growers. We don't have control over them. And even like the one little example I really liked about Driscoll's is they still do some berries in California and just south of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, that's the headquarters of Driscoll's. And some of the farm workers asked them, please don't do berry. Like if you're going to do berry production right next to our children's schools, please do organics because all the toxic chemicals coming off. And keep in mind, like we said earlier, Driscoll's sells one in three berries. And then their market share in organics is even higher. But what does Driscoll, the, the owners of Driscoll say, the brothers? Oh, we can't do anything. Our, our growers can do whatever they want. And it's just like, dude, come on. Do, do, do organic. You can tell your growers to do organic around there, but that way they can be naive to the labor environmental exploitations. So when you see these scandals break out, the companies can be like, oh, this was a bad contractor, which in reality is this is by design. Is The contractors are pushed to squeeze as low as possible. And then when they get caught, you know, it's just... Oopsie, oopsie. Chapter three is the Coffee Barons. And this is a company out of, I think you see, I mean, they're probably headquartered in, in Luxembourg for tax purposes, but they're really a family from Germany. But they sell more coffee than even Starbucks. And I think the the average person, if you just went into one of their stores, you would, of course, never suspect that. Yeah, this is one of my favorite little cocktail chatter ones because um, it blows people's minds when I list all the brands I own. And keep in mind, they didn't sell a single bean of coffee in America until 2012. I mean, their whole business strategy is they see competitive markets and they they do what's called a roll-up in the private equity where you throw a bunch of money at it. You buy a bunch of brands to essentially create a market dominance. So in 2012, they bought Pete's Coffee. And then they quickly bought Panera Bread, Krispy Kreme, Prada Major, Intelligentsia, Stumptown, Little so Curry Cups, Trade Coffee, Noah's Bagels, Burgers, Bagels. I mean, the list goes on. Because all that is is about getting a bunch of market power so that when you... It's what used to be 20 different coffee buyers for coffee farmers are now just one. And they can really dictate terms. And anyone who's been to any of these brands, Panera especially, they're, they are not what they used to be. These people in the day don't know how to run coffee. They're just running these brands into the ground. They have that market dominance. And to me, this chapter, though, I'm telling you the history of antitrust laws in America and the recent collapse of them. But at the same time, too, is I really want to make this point in this chapter that monopolists finance fascist. And so I tell this like forgotten history of World War II, where after the war, a big part of America's reconstruction were breaking up the cartels that finance 
Hitler and um, notably IG Farben. Like Hitler's largest donor was a chemical company that, you know, he'd walk into a room and be like, well, I don't mean the crazy stuff. I'll help you sell chemicals. Turns out they help them make the gas for the gas chambers. And so I just really wanted to make that point, given the state of the world right now, it's, it's the parallels you're seeing in different things. It's scary. And also like, this isn't organic growth. This is growth through acquisitions. And what the coffee baron did buying all these companies, they could not have done just a few decades ago. Like the we've had a radical collapse of our antitrust framework in America. You've mentioned obesity quite a few times in the book. How much does this kind of concentration and conglomeration of food lead to obesity? I think a good question. What really shaped me here was a book by Julie Guthman at University of California, Santa Cruz. And she really made this argument that for so long, we framed obesity as a personal choice thing. When it really is structural, you need money to eat healthy in America because of the way the farm bill structured, we heavily subsidize junk food and we don't give really any subsidies like carrots. And so you just kind of see that play out in class in America where the higher incomes tend to be the less overweight classes and like the most obese states tend to be the poorer states. And the other thing too, is you have the whole going back to Cargill and grains is corn syrup. So like sugar is really a really interesting market because before corn syrup, you had, you know, cane sugar and that's a, that has a limited production region, like basically Louisiana and Florida because of the weather. And then you had beet sugar, which is something called supply management, where they try to limit how much is grown. And that's generally up in northern Minnesota, the Dakotas. And so like sugar, you know, I mean, it was not expensive, but you know what I mean? It wasn't, there wasn't a surplus. Well, then here comes corn, where the goal of the farm bill now is to overproduce corn and soy. So you have to find new uses for overproduction. So instead of growing apples, you just find a new use for corn. So that's how you get dumb things like ethanol. But going back to corn syrup is in the 70s and 80s, they figured out, out a way to make it economically, to make it really cheap. And so that's why you see this flood of corn syrup. So you see corn syrup put into everything. Walmart loves it because it has a long shelf life. It doesn't expire. And so to me, that's really what's turbocharged this inequality. And the thing I've been wrestling with a lot now, and I really don't know how this is going to play out, is this, this Ozempic stuff. I mean, I have a lot of people in my family on it. My hunch is it'll reinforce inequality in America like um, more, and that'll be like a, another marker of have, have not, where you'll see maybe the middle tier of America, maybe the lower middle tier go on Ozempic, especially as they move to a pill farm, make it cheaper. But that bottom quintile, I don't know if they'll be able to ever afford it. I mean, that's like the big tension point now is, you know, the highest use of Ozempic is on the Upper East Side of New York City. <laughs> That's assuming that there's no long-term health effects yeah. of that. I mean, yeah, maybe, exactly. Maybe in 10 years from now, it'll be th that will be reverse, or it'll be like the p reverse pyramid of that. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that. I would never yeah, do no, that if I. <laughs> totally, I am. I totally agree with you there. I mean, this whole thing is scary. I mean, it's. Here's the thing, though. Can we just stop subsidizing junk food? I mean, that that what what a radical idea. Yeah, it's what a radical idea. I agree. And in your book, I noticed you didn't really mention this at all. And I was kind of surprised, even though you're talking about barons, but you never really talked about the implementation in 1992 of the U.S. Uh, food pyramid, which is, of course, created by the USDA. That had a significant in impact on just how you know school programs and hospitals and other public institutions had to implement these strategies that are just really unhealthy and you know obesity was kind of taken off in the late 70s early 80s and i think corn syrup and telling people that fat's bad and you know like margarine instead of butter etc cetera, etc cetera. what was your thought on the 1992 food pyramid i'm glad you asked that is one so my court the core point, the core chapter to me of this book is really my coffee chapter. It's really about monopoly, what concentration did to the food system. Um, I've been toying with, I mean, I might add new chapters to the book. I might do a second book of additional barons, but the dietary stuff really to me connects to my dairy chapter in a weird way. As we privatized higher ed, private dollars filled that void. And so you just see so much junk science. And that's what that kind of chapter is about, is a corruption of a USDA program meant to help family farmers called checkoffs that really now is undermining them and financing a lot of this junk science. Like why put, you know, putting ethanol in the airplanes. But by the way, that's what the Secretary of Agriculture wants to do right now for the climate crisis. Um, but that's what's going on in these universities. I've heard a lot of stories from people where if you're not writing papers friendly to the industry, you're not getting tenure. 
You're not bringing in grant money. You're pushed out the door. So that that's something I'm looking at down the road. That and also what I under appreciate and I want to do more work on is the massive consolidation we see in the farmland in America. I mean, Bill Gates is now one of the largest owners of farmland. And what, what does that mean for our system? When farming, there's been a disconnect between those that work it and those that own it. And you're actually seeing it, to me, you're seeing it play out really clearly right now in this bird flu crisis. I mean, most, quote, dairy farmers are just capital asset managers, and they're not working with the cows anymore. So they don't really care. I mean, they don't care about their workers. I'll, I'll just be blunt. Um, and so you're just seeing them. The lack of concern for the workers right now with the bird flu going on in the dairy industry is horrific. I and mean, we're playing with, you know, it's like watching Russian roulette. So just to your question, going back to the FDA thing, what that whole thing reminded me of is the American food system now is radical. It is radical that the food pyramid, pyramid did what it did, said, told people what to do. It is radical that one man does 5 million hogs a year in Iowa. It is radical that you know, a dairy operation in Indiana does as much manure in a single day as the city of Austin, Texas. And so much of the reforms people have been pushing for are very traditional, which is something like industry hacks will always say you're radical. And you're like, no, this is this is pretty off the rails. What's happened to America, America's food system. You meant, mentioned checkoffs. And unless you read the book, I don't think the average person <laughs> really know what that means. Yeah. So but this is kind of a two part question. But one, explain that. But then secondly, you mentioned talking about checkoffs, you know, how they have these industries have this extra money that the marketing department basically figured out like, hey, like these commercials just aren't working anymore. Advertisements aren't working anymore because people like, oh, that's just from big agriculture. So then they started funneling money into research. I remember years ago where it's like dark chocolates, you know, super healthy for you. It's a superfood. And it's like funded by Mars. It's like, yeah, well, maybe the the actual cocoa is healthy, but what about the pound of sugar that's put in there to make the bitter you know, cocoa tastes sweet. Yeah, maybe that's not healthy for you. Oh, totally. I mean, that's just stepping back. I think an underappreciated thing of this era is how much language is designed to keep people out. In agriculture, there's a phrase called H2A visas for farm workers. It's really just an indentured servitude program, but we don't say those words. And checkoffs are like something incredibly complex designed so no, very few people understand them. And so it's just naturally it's a lack of transparency and the capturing of the programs. Like most things in the food system, they start off with good intentions. I mean, they go back to the New Deal where literally farmers in Florida, you, you would check a box, you'd pay a little tax into a pot of money to advertise, drink more Florida orange juice. They really didn't matter. And most of them still don't. There's like 20 of them now in America. There's a popcorn, there's a Christmas tree. They're the ones at county fairs that give you free little samples. They're great. They're small. What happened though in the 80s is as the farm bill started overproducing a few things, a few of these checkoffs became monsters. You know, how do we get you to eat more cheese and ice cream? Literally, as another branch of government says, don't eat more cheese and ice cream. So the dairy one in particular is massive. It's the biggest one. It's like $600, $700 million a year. We don't actually know how big its budget is because uh, USDA is atrocious at overseeing it. There are so many government accountability reports every few years that just document the incompetency and the corruption of the program. By the way, keep in mind... President Biden's current Secretary of Agriculture is a former industrial dairy lobbyist who worked for one of these checkoffs between administrations. So like one little example of his incompetency and corruption is he's mandated every year to re give a report to Congress on the dairy checkoff. He would take four years to you know file a report. Just basic little like things like that. But going back to it, like you said, on marketing is um, my dairy baron captured this program. He basically took money from family farmers going broke and used that money against them to helped build this tourist attraction, advertising his industrial dairy model, driving them into bankruptcy. He used it to help establish his own premium product known as Fairlife, which is like a, you know, a yuppie version of milk. And then he also used it to finance his junk science. And another scary thing, and you know, as these marketing people switched from ads, like got milk to these junk studies is how, how unenforced disclosure policies are at academic journals and to me, it's, it's really bad in agriculture economics. You go to some of these, you know, some of these academics websites and they'll brag about how much corporate money they're taking. But then when they write academic papers, they don't disclose it, even though um, these, these journals have policies. And like, there's a famous example of one at Arizona State that was just actually was just published in a law journal where this young lawyer documented 
he edits the journal and it doesn't disclose it doesn't you know it doesn't bother to do this stuff and then this is the same man that's getting a ton of newspaper press saying price gouging isn't a thing in the grocery stores but he doesn't tell you that he's taking money from the grocery stores so that really warps the conversation and i realized writing this book is every industry has their handful of hacks like this i mean life is easy if you do the bidding the rich and that's all they're doing but it really undermines things and so that to me is what kind of going back to this bigger mudding of the waters and a lot of the parallels you see with checkoffs go back to the cigarette industry. The cigarette had its own kind of version of a checkoff. Um, and, you know, the similar thing happened there. And I think that's what's happening with the junk food stuff in America right now. With uh, AI and the rise of robotics and whatnot, it, it seems like, you know, you mean, at the end of the book, you know, in your conclusion, you kind of offered some solutions, which we could get to later. But it seems like with the rise of automation, it seems like we'll actually just have more concentration and not less. You're either going to be able to afford the equipment. You're talking about the dairy farm that you're talking about in Indiana. They basically have like robotic milkers and ro robotic machines that clean up the, the manure and do a lot of the work. I think for the average person, they probably don't realize that the agriculture sector in itself is one of the most automated robotic sectors of any industry. To think like you could have a tractor plow a field that is completely, you know, driverless automated because like, you know, it's just going in, you know, essentially a circle in some, in a field, right? I mean, they're not really at risk of any traffic violations or pedestrians or things like that. So even if it did make a mistake, the risk is really low. So the automation in the agriculture sector has always kind of been ahead of the curve to begin with. I guess this is just, you know, kind of a thought I have, but what, what's your argument or, or whatever, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just Yeah, no, no, I, I'm just like, I'm smiling because the thought, when you just articulated, I'm, I have not really heard someone else articulate that. And it's so, I think it's, it's, it's so obvious to me. I think it helps that I'm from Iowa, you're from Wisconsin, so we kind of get this. And I think there's a naiveness on the coast. Like there's almost a bumpkinness to these worlds where you're like, no, these modern farming in America is incredibly tech advanced and capital intensive. These farm operations are managing real money here. The dirty secret in Iowa is the richest person. It's usually an old, actually an old farm widow <laughs> uh, because they usually own millions of dollars worth of farmland. But to your example, I, that crystallized in my head right before COVID when I went to a farm show in Little Rock and I realized, oh, these tractors, are, they drive themselves. And everyone talks about driverless cars, but like you said, they're going to happen before cars because they're not going to kill anyone. They'll go into a ditch when they screw up. So to your question about AI, technology, all that stuff, yes and no is my answer. Yes, I think a lot more grain production will be robotics. And that's not a bad thing, especially again, um, you've seen a lot of advances in like picking produce kind of stuff. And there's like a whole YouTube uh, rabbit hole you can go down just watching like out of you know robotic you know blueberry pickers and all that kind of stuff that said what gives me hope and to me what you can't do fully robotic is putting animals on the land we cannot have animals concentrated like we do now most dairy cows aren't on land anymore they're they're shoved into a massive metal shed the environment can't handle that much manure it, it just can't and it's not good it also doesn't make a good product a dairy cow who eats grass on pasture makes a much better tasting product than one shoved into a metal shed eating corn. So my goal is to put animals back on the land. And there's only so many dairy cow one human being can look after. I mean, sure, you could have auto, you know, robotic milkers and that kind of stuff, but kind of deconcentrating these systems of just, you know, let's just go back to the system where, which by the way, that's what like Ireland has. That's what like a lot of other countries have. Like our system in dairy is very radical. I mean, that's why the cult thing right now in America, or sorry, the food obsession is the Irish butter. And that's just because that's the way butter used to be in America. It's just pasture butter. That's why it's orange. That's why it tastes better. So that's like my big hope is sure, we shouldn't run away from robotics in, Amer in the food system, but not everything can be automated. And the other thing to keep in mind here too, I think it's really underappreciated is what the consolidation of these data system systems mean the food system. Um, I think underappreciated about both Cargill and the Coke industries is they're massive traders. And it, by having all these new data sets come online, that's an additional informational advantage to them in their trading. So like just being proactive over what does this mean for farm data? When these track these John Deere tractors are taking in so much data, who owns it? You know, just kind of thinking that way. And there's just not much thought going on there because I don't think people realize how far ahead we are there. In your book, you talk a lot about Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, which exposed the meat packers in the was it the early or was it the late nineteenth century in Chicago. 
And you basically say, like, you know, people actually were, really weren't that appalled about the worker conditions. They were appalled about the conditions that their food was being processed in. And I feel like the same thing is today. You talk a lot about the, kind of the, the working conditions, but I don't think really people care about that. I think people care about the price point and how nu- nutritious their food is. And if they can get it, I guess the food quality seems to be the bigger issue more so than the worker issues. And how do you connect that to the average shopper? Yeah, so kind of two things there. One, part of my goal of using this Robert Barron framework is to show people we've been here before. And I just think we're living in another Gilded Age, second Gilded Age, late stage laissez-faire era. These eras always come to a close. The question now is we got to start thinking about what do we do after they kind of come to an end, how to reform them. Is Especially at the late, and I really do believe at the end of these kind of late stage eras, everyone's just trying to survive. Like they're hyper-individualistic because... We get kind of numb to these these abusive workers. I mean, that's the sad truth is I don't think anyone was shocked that slaughterhouses were caught employing children earlier this year. We saw how they treated their workers during COVID, how they just utterly did not care. That said, what I really want to focus on, what I usually start all my talks with, are what Americans spend at the grocery store. An industry will always love to say this makes cheap food, but when you actually pull data from USDA, Americans spend more money at the grocery store than... Germany, the UK, Canada, you know, we're basically dollar for dollar with Italy. And uh, I think anyone that's been in Italy knows what a dollar gets you in Italy and a dollar in America for food are very different things. And we shouldn't be shocked by that. I mean, concentrated markets gouge, that's what they do. And so that's, and this is, this data, by the way, is from 2021 before this, like really this greed inflation took hold in America. And so, you know, that's my goal here, show people how, yes, you can feel sorry for the pigs, the cows, the way they're treated in this, but also in the day you're paying, you're being, you're paying more for junk. And that's what I really want to do is at the same time too, I'm a big believer in that the biggest changes in America come from putting together weird bedfellows. And you're just kind of seeing everyone pissed, especially in the meat. That's where my, like, that's why going back to Bill Sack, I was angry is this is the easiest thing to get done right now in America. Cause you have ranchers being pit or being gouged consumers at the store workers. These are foreign companies. They are also like, they, they, they bribe the way to monopoly level status. Like I'm not even talking campaign contributions. Like they pled guilty to giving Manhattan apartments as bribes. <laughs> and we let them, not only do we let them keep their empire that they built through bribery and corruption, but USA Bill Sachs still gives them contracts because they're quote too big. And at what point, like if you, if a company doesn't, if a child doesn't face consequences, they're going to keep getting worse. It's just a cost of doing business for them. Since you're, concluding chapter offered some solutions what are some solutions like like i said earlier my big one is putting animals back on the land is and part of it my hope here too is an underappreciated thing by by the biden administration is their aggressive push to make american cars hybrids and evs has meant that the fourth it, it sped up the death of ethanol i really do think ethanol has been one of the most destructive things to hit the midwest because it pushed a lot of animals off the land because it was, you know, the economics push you to do corn instead of doing pasture. It's also just like such a waste. I mean, why, we're, we're using fossil fuels to grow food for fuel, and it's at best a wash for the climate. So my whole thing is, as ethanol dies, we put in, we use that moment to put animals back on the land. So like that's my big picture thing. My second thing is, is as we kind of phase out this old system, is use the purchasing power of schools to really drive positive to drive this new system. Like who doesn't want all dairy served in Wisconsin coming from Wisconsin dairy farmers, you know, who do dairy and pasture. You're keeping your food local, you're keeping your dollars local. And also like even being a cafeteria worker, instead of just cooking frozen food, why not let them just cook from scratch? A lot of community colleges have really good culinary programs built on that. Let people, so people just want to work with their hands and, you know, make good food. Let's reward that, make that a solid middle-class living. And then the other thing too, is just a lot of this is, these are just monopolies that have gone off the rails and just bringing back like old fashioned trust busting, but also some bright line rules. Like Iowa has a law in the books. We don't enforce it, but we should, and we should do it nationally called a Packer ban, which basically says you cannot own the animal you slaughter, which basically is, that means corporations can't own animals, which unbeknownst to most people. So Smithfield is the largest butcher of hogs in America, but in Smithfield's owned by the WH group of China, but they also own the most hogs. They own like one in four, one in five hogs. And so if you just enforce that simple rule, that Packer ban, you'd break the company up. You know, I had 
the author of the book the wolves of k street on talking about lobbyist and it's a good book the yeah it's a good book the guy's a pulitzer prize winning author i might add <laughs> but anyways uh he thought you know towards the end of the the podcast he thought that the biggest change in the next couple decades is we're going to actually have antitrust to be busting up these monopolies that's what he his kind of thought was do you think he's correct in that do you think because it's not just of course i think the average person when they think of monopolies they're thinking in the tech sector and like you mentioned with the peanut butter example or the eyeglass example do you think that these are separate companies and you even mentioned about the the, com- the meat company from brazil about how it's like they don't actually use their name in the u.s you don't even realize that the the company is a brazilian company right so I think for a lot of people, they it's not necessarily that they even know that they're dealing with a monopoly, except for something like tech, where you use your Gmail account for everything. It's obvious yeah. that you know you use Google for search. I mean, it's a little bit more, I think, obvious. It's um, I kind of compared in my head to you know in the Midwest when you know a storm's coming in the summer, you can just feel it, you can taste it. That's how I feel about this. The conditions are just ripe. It's so broken. It's also when you learn about monopolies and trust in high school. It's meat what you learn about. Like, we're not talking AI, we're talking hogs. And like, this isn't rocket science here. It's really just a question of political courage. And the classic thing with monopolies is they always go too far. And they're, they're, they're creating a, the right conditions for someone to do something. And I should also say, as much as I critique Vilsack, I think in, in the food industry, you, you see both President Biden's worst and best political appointee. His best, I, I really do believe, is that young woman named Lena Khan. She's current chair of the Federal Trade Commission. She's ushering in this new era of antitrust law in America. I mean, honestly, it's returning us back to that Louis Brandeis, so that framework from a century ago, where we just want to avoid concentrations of power because it corrupts a political system. And let's be frank, no company buys another company for pro-competitive reasons. So she was really doing that. She's part of the reason why the Biden administration just won that case against Google for being a monopolist. And then, you know, they have a bunch of other cases pending and they're going after tech and all that kind of stuff. That said... Um, you, she can, she has antitrust authority and all the, F, the, the markets in America accept meat backing. USA has a carve out there. So Vilsack is one to oversee those markets. I should also say with Lena is I think people crave a hero right now. They crave someone, a public servant standing up to power and winning. Um, to me, she embodies that, you know, that statue of the young girl standing up to the wall street bull. She embodies that. I mean, she walks into any law school in America right now. The kids adore her. They want to be her. You're seeing tons more scholarship written by them on what to do with antitrust. At the same time, too, she did an event in Iowa on fertilizer consolidation this summer, and she got 100 people in a room. She packed a room. No bureaucrat can get 100 people in a room. And then, like, um, you had just, like, a lot of farmers, a lot of just people in the area just want to go see someone. Like, it's refreshing to see someone doing the right thing and winning. And so... I, I totally agree with that author of just, you just know something's going to happen here. And also, by the way, this doesn't happen overnight. We, we compress history. I mean, going back to the history of antitrust in America, everyone thinks of Teddy Roosevelt, but I mean, the first antitrust laws in the world were actually written in, in Iowa. And they were written by farmers pissed off at railroads. And then Congress eventually, by the work of a bunch of states, eventually did something at the, at the federal level. But it took a few presidents before Roosevelt actually utilized those laws. So like we think this happened overnight, but it didn't. It came from the local level and people working hard to drive this change, to snowball this up. And so that's like that's what I really think is happening here. And it's easy to be really dark right now, but at the same time too, you see people like Lena doing the right thing and like I mean, you have Matt Gates praising her in the Wall Street Journal. There's something to be said here. I've done several podcasts on the declining fertility rate. The fertility rate of the US is like one point six two, which is quite a bit below replacement rate. So every grade in school is basically the grade ahead of it is, you know, is bigger than the grade below it. Talking about how I, you know, grew up on a farm. I could have taken over the family farm, which I didn't, didn't. It wasn't like I grew up on a dairy farm, which, you know, if you got a dairy farm, you're working seven days a week, you're getting up at 5 a.m. to milk the cows and you got to milk them, milk them later. And I think with this big push to like everyone basically go to university, even if you grew up on a, on a family farm, society tells you like, why take it over? You can go to college, get some white collar job, make more money and not be up at five o'clock, seven days a week. And then not to mention the stigma. People think you're a moron if you're a farmer. My dad, you know, is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And of course, he doesn't have any college 
education and had a pretty you know good career because of it. But it seems like even if we wanted to break up these massive corporations, I'm not sure if we would have enough little farms to kind of take over the production based on decreasing fertility rate, kids not wanting to do it. What would you say to kind of this this argument? Um, a few things. I well, first of all, to me, the bigger story here is the collapse of the middle, the middle class family farm. You have the, the food system now is either these niche small things or someone has like an off farm income that really pays the bills while you have these industrial capital asset managers. The problem with this industrial model is it's incredibly fragile. I mean, you're seeing this with diseases now. Some of these animals are genetically similar where the second a disease gets inside these metal sheds, it just, they go up like wildfire. You, you can't do that. You're asking for trouble. Diversity creates resilience and that's what you want in a system. And also like just even from like a, just even from like a livelihood standpoint, you can have 10 rural farm families or you can have one you know, person. Those 10 farm families pay taxes on their kids to the local high school where the other one hides its money in Puerto Rico. To your question about labor and that kind of stuff, I think there's a decent chunk of people who grew up in the urban or suburban America who want to who wanna leave that and do their urban life. But the problem is the economics. I mean, it's how can you, if you're trying to be that middle-class dairy farmer, how can you compete on price against something, an operation using undocumented labor and exploiting the heck out of them? You can't. I mean, you're going to go bankrupt. Like you're not, you're designed to fail. I think there's a lot more people that people realize just want to be their own boss. I'm glad you said dairy farmers because what I realize is they have the most intimate relationship with their animals. I mean, every dairy cow to them is like a dog. They know their personalities. They see them twice a day. Um, that's why I realized, you know, visiting dairy farmers and then you go to an industrial dairy farm and they're just an line item on an Excel sheet. Um, and I'm also saying this probably, I'm really influenced by my mom. I mean, I talk about her bakery in, in uh, my coffee chapter where, you know, there's no coffee native to Iowa in the day. You're kind of selling the same product, but it's about the relationship she built with people that people came to her store. And the sense of ownership and pride she had in her business that was lost when she, when she then went to go work for Starbucks, which if you ever work at Starbucks, they tell you where to even put each bean on the shelf. So I think if we made it so you can make a decent middle class living doing this stuff, I think a lot more people would do it. And I think rural communities would be out there for it. I think we'd make better tasting food and I think it'd make a more resilient farm system. But I mean, a lot of this goes to the fertility stuff. I mean, it's just people feel so economically insecure right now. It's to have a kid. It's just such a financial burden. Yeah, you mentioned Bill Gates before. As you also mentioned, he's the largest landowner of yeah. farms in the U.S. I think most people would be pretty surprised to hear that. He was one of the big investors of fake meat companies or artificial meat, whatever you want to call it. You hear about harvesting bugs and things like that. But if you're looking at it through the lenses of, of Bill Gates, I mean, you can basically have one factory and what, what do they call like precision fermentation where you are essentially artificially growing these animals? That would be even more monopolized, even more concentrated if we actually did have this artificial meat. And they say that we already have some artificial meat now, but do you think that we're actually going to have this artificial meat trend? Are people going to be rejected? I mean, I think beyond... What is it? Uh, was it Beyond Burger or whatever? Some of those have been kind of epic, epic flops. Or beyond? Was it Beyond Meat? What was the name of that? that? Yeah, Beyond Meat or something. Was it I mean, something? Yeah, and it was a, it was a flop. Right? People just didn't like it. I mean, it's. I mean, to me, this is just a good example of the rich people aren't going to save us. In the day, he got his money from being, having an IP monopoly of software. And he's doing the same thing here. They want to have an IP monopoly over how to make this stuff. That's why he cares. I mean, it, it's just it's greed, it's self interest, whatever the mark. The, the silver, the ray of hope here is the marketplace spoke and people didn't like these products. At the same time, too, is like you kind of said this and you're seeing it more is a lot of the fast food, a lot of the beef is cut with soy. So it might be like 51% beef and 49% soy. Um, it's, it makes it, 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 there's a quality degradation going on there. But like the bug stuff is, I mean, Cargill's invested in bugs, but they're using in, in sex more as a protein feed for industrial animals. So, you know, I might have industrial pigs inside of metal shed eating bugs to make more meat. Who knows? I mean, this stuff is, I just kind of go back to the, going back to the farm bill and Bill Gates is, he's an example of just how broken everything is. So like crop insurance to me is the best example of how broken the farm bill is, where when people hear crop insurance, they, they, they think it's for floods and that kind of stuff. It's not. It's insurance for low prices, where 60% of the premium is paid for by taxpayers. And there's also no cap. 
Also, it only applies to certain things, not other things. So Bill Gates can get as much insurance for low prices to grow corn as he wants. Whereas he wants to grow, if you want to grow carrots, you don't get anything. So part of what this system does in, with land consolidation is that person who grows up in, let's say, a hobby farm or Appleton and wants to go start their own dairy farm, you can't, you can't compete against you can't compete in the marketplace against Bill Gates buying farmland. He'll, he'll outbid you. And the subsidies, he also has a, a benefit. And so that's like a big point here of this, to me, the system is this, like the farm bill is designed for Wall Street and no one else. And that's why also like for every dollar you spend at the store, what the farmer gets, it's the lowest recorded in American history. So this fake meat stuff to me, it's just the farm, the food system is just obsessed with fads. That's, that's like really my hot take here. There's always a magic cure-all, and they're really, in life, there never is a cure-all, even going back to those obesity drugs. In the day, I'll take, it takes a few things to fix a system. And so that's, from, that's, where I, that's what I think. And where do farmers' markets fit into this whole picture? Uh, <laughs> I think they're, and I'm saying this from like an Iowa perspective, I think they're a really cool social thing. The biggest thing in Cedar Rapids, my, my hometown right now, is the night farmers' market. Because you can get a beer, they have games, you can get some produce. It's just, I think people want to see each other, especially with the death of malls. We need p more public spaces. So I really want to lean into that because it's just, I used to live in, I used to live in Madison, Wisconsin. And like, dear God, the farmer's market on a Saturday is like the most sceny place in the city. You see everyone. Uh, but so we'll let's do that. But also like, I don't want people to have the solution that farmer's markets are driving system change. Most people don't do most of the grocery store at farmer's market. It's kind of where you go to get a few things, get, you know what I mean, get some food, but it's not the main thing. And a lot of farmers will tell you privately, they're not the biggest fan of farmer's markets. You get rained out. It's not consistent. That's why I really want to use schools and colleges to help drive that supply chain, just because the school will buy the same amount of carrots every week. And for that farmer, that really stabilizes their business. It gives them predictability. So that's like, I don't want to dismiss farmers markets because i really do think they're a really good cultural thing and i think especially now with the epidemic loneliness we should really lean on to those do more of that i mentioned earlier today austin your bio you are a former tax economist at the u.s <laughs> treasury department and, and you were a co-chair of the biden campaign's agriculture and antitrust policy committee you know so you kind of have an inside perspective working for the government do you think that like we will see this this boat kind of Turn around. I mean, I think anyone that's been to Europe and a lot of other countries, their food quality is just significantly superior to the U.S. I lived in Luxembourg for a while. I didn't even want to come back to the U.S. mostly just because of like the you know, the food. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I thought your bio was pretty interesting. What do you have? You obviously know a lot more than the average person does studying this, being involved in this, kind of getting hands in the manure, so to speak. I really do. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm laughing. Uh, <laughs> I really do think so. I mean, um, I mean, just go back. Let's go back to Lena Khan. I went down this whole road because in 2016, I was, you know, I was at Treasury. I was writing a, a paper. I kid you not on the growth of monopoly level profits in the tax code. And I was seeing them in pharmaceuticals and like, okay, that's to be expected. You get an IP monopoly when you create a drug. But I was seeing it in food. And I was like, what's going on here? So I was Googling around and I read these articles about chicken monopolies. And I reached out to the journalist who was in law school at the time, and her name was Lena Khan. <laughs> and here I am. We got coffee in D.C. in 2016. She kind of explained to me what's going on. I was like, oh, this really explains to me what's going on back home in Iowa, kind of what I was thinking politically at the time. And then this woman is now one of the most powerful people in, in America. And you know what I mean? And she's, I believe, 33, 34, the young mother. Like, these things can change, and they can change fast. But no one's going to give you a seat at the table. I mean, part of the reason why she got appointed was um, Biden was pressured. And he was also, like, politically rewarded for doing it. I mean, it makes him look good by her success. And that's why I tell a lot of people in my little world, the food world, is you got to fight for a seat at the table. Because when you elect a president, you're electing thousands of appointees. And so you really got to push for that get key positions of power at USDA. Because the right secretary, the right undersecretaries could really change the system. Um because it's so gluttonous, it's so rotten. You just lift up the hood and it's just like, there's just so much there to work with. And so, I mean, it's a weird thing. I think all the time where I made my husband for our honeymoon, we went to Italy because I just want to see a food system that worked. 
and my big takeaway was like Iowa should be the Tuscany of North America. Um, it has the best soil. Um, it's great for growing stuff, but Iowa is also canary in the coal mine for America. If we don't change well, the trajectory we're on in the food system, Iowa has the second highest cancer rate in the country now. Has an obesity crisis. Has a water crisis. None of the wealth it's generating staying there. It's an extraction colony, but it doesn't have to be this way. That that's my big. Really, my big point in my book is we can choose to have a different system, but using our you know using our forks to do it doesn't work. You got to push for structural change. And you got to care. I mean, like I didn't even realize I did this until after the fact. My book opens with Julie Dunn, a retired uh, administrative assistant in rural Iowa. She fights my hog baron. That is what she's decided to do in her retirement. Is she re- reads all the reports, sees all like goes to all the county meetings, fights his um his hog confinements because she knew what Iowa used to be. She remembers and doesn't want her granddaughter to grow up in that. But she, she told me this straight up. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get there to the promise land overnight. It's going to take a lot of work, but that's what she's like. That's what I want to make. That's what I want to do is she was like, I'm sick of complaining. You got to fight for a seat at the table and you really got to join a group. I mean, it, 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 that's like, you can't do this alone. I, I encourage people to join your local farmers union chapter, your local de- like, whatever kind of group, but these change, the best, biggest changes in America come from people coming together and fighting power and demanding more. Today's guest has been Austin Farrick, author of the new book, Barons, Money, Power, and the Corruption of America's Food Industry. Two final questions for you, Austin, to say, uh, first is thank you for joining us today, spending an hour. So the two questions is let people know where they can find you, get a hold of you, buy your book, that kind of information. Then after that, just leave us with a final thought related to your book or whatever is currently on your mind. Yeah. So uh, you can find me on socials. And my personal website is Austin Frerick, A U S T I N F R E R I C K. Honestly, I love, let me know when if, when you read my book, which chapter you find the most interesting. I love hearing that. Or there's things I miss, or there's barons I should know about. I have a whole document going. Um, but to kind of leave people with two thoughts. One, I really recommend this book called 10 Restaurants That Changed America. This author, you know, he up, uh, I didn't know this, the New York Library has a whole archive of restaurant menus. So this writer uses different menus to show how proteins have changed in steakhouses, all that kind of stuff. But at each restaurant, he's telling a different story. It's like one is Delmonico's in New York, which is like the oldest steakhouse in America. So it tells the history of steakhouses in America. And another one is about soul food, Four Seasons, all that kind of stuff. I just thought it was a really lovely read. And the second is just kind of going to what I was just saying a few minutes ago. It's really focus on the positive, what the system could be. I just feel like right now no one's articulating a positive vision in the food system, especially in rural America. And people crave it. That's what inspires people to rush the gates to keep on fighting is it's really easy with to get overwhelmed by this moment, just shut down. And that's when power wins. And part of why I did the Robert Barron framework too was it's almost campy to me. Like it's ridiculous and morally repulsive that a dairy farmer claims residency at the Ritz Carlton in Puerto Rico. Like he's just cosplaying at that point. And so I wanted to lean into that to show people like, this is ridiculous. Let's do something about it. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode.